Welcome everyone to today's interview with soon to be Dr. Kanan Murthy. We are really excited to have him here today to share how he navigated the med school application process and succeeded, even though he didn't have the most competitive MCAT score. And we really hope that this interview is going to give you some great strategies to help you on your journey as well. Kanan worked with us for his med school applications, which included a brainstorming session and application reviews for his personal statement, uh, work activity sections, secondary essays, and he also worked with us for his interviews. Kanan, can you say hi to everyone? Hey, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah. 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 So my name is Meng Yang, and I'm a senior admissions expert here at BMO, and it's my pleasure and privilege to be here interviewing Conan. So let's get right into it. Conan, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Where are you from? How'd you grow up? What's your family like? Just for us to get to know you a little bit. All right. Yeah. So um, I grew up well, um, in the East Bay area, in Pleasanton. So it's about like 30 to 40 minutes east of San Jose for most people who aren't aware. Um, I was raised here, went to middle school, high school and everything here. Went to college in UC Santa Cruz. And my family, they, they all work in tech, so I'm going to be the first like uh, doctor in the family. So, okay. so yeah, and I'm a current Western U comp student. I'm a current first year. Uh, we just finished our first semester in med school. So, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Okay, so you're from Northern California, Bay Area. You um you come from a family that you know where medicine was not already in you know, your background. There was nobody in your family that um that knew this path personally. Okay, cool. And how and when did you decide that you wanted to become a physician, having come from a family of <laughs> non-physicians, engineers? Yeah, yeah. so personally, um, I've always been into fitness ever since high school. Like, I would love to exercise, help people, like, coach people through, like, exercise, too. And then that's what made me want to major in biology. So I've always mm-hmm. been had a knack for science. So majored in bio, then I realized, you know, um, but do, like, tutoring people and tutoring students. So best blend of my academic passions and also my hobbies would be to become a physician. Um, so, so yeah, that was, that was kind of like the spark that kicked it off where I wanted to, when I knew I wanted to be a physician. So um, mm-hmm. that was so, early under my freshman, freshman year of college. So. Okay. Okay. So you, you decided very early on, um, if I recall correctly, you went to University of California, Santa Cruz and yep. specifically Cruz. you studied molecular biology, right? Yep, molecular cell and developmental bio is a specific major, what it was called, but usually people are shortened down to molecular bio. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Um, now, were you when you applied to med school, were you a first time applicant or um, a, a re applicant? How many times did you end up applying to med school? Yeah, so I only applied once. So it was my mm-hmm. first application cycle where I got in. So, so yeah. Got you, got you, and. Just thinking back to when um, you decided to apply to med school eventually down the road, what were you most worried about in terms of the whole process? What were your biggest concerns? Okay, so my biggest concerns about the process were just how much it's just luck based in general. Like you just, <laughs> it's just the numbers getting you applied to as many schools as you can, and it's um, at the school pretty much tries to, uh, tries to see you as like you know. Like, a competitive applicant and it's yeah it's like even though there's so many like schools out there like the class sizes are so small that it's like it's really hard to like kind of gauge whether an applicant is guaranteed to get in or not so right. there's a lot of volatile, volatility about the process which is what i was concerned about going in yeah yeah and i i think you're speaking to something really interesting which is that well of course it's very competitive to get into med school and i think everyone knows that even before they do any research about the actual application process um but you like when you're talking about the volatility of the process you're you're probably referencing the fact that you know even people with really great stats and really high scores sometimes end up not getting accepted and then and then sometimes people with less competitive scores do get up, end up getting accepted to med school and going to med school and then moving forward with that career path. So, so I guess that's where some of the, what you're talking about, the luck-based process is referring to, but we're actually going to hopefully see throughout this interview that for you, it wasn't so luck-based. You took very specific steps to maximize your chances. And we're mm-hmm. hoping that this is really going to help 
everyone out there who's going to see this interview to maximize their chances as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, you're in your first year of med school, which means you applied during during a very interesting time. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I applied pretty much a year right after the COVID, COVID hit. So um, about June of 2021 is when I sent in my primary. So um, so yeah, like um, a lot of the med schools already know about um, that COVID impact and long-term experiences and whatnot. So, so I think that also helped a bit. But I also had more than 150 clinical hours and also over 100 non-clinical hours, like through my freshman year and my beginning of my sophomore year of college. So that also helped quite a bit like just so I started early um but yeah I know a lot of applicants who it, like COVID just impacted their extracurriculars so so mm-hmm. going into the application cycle yeah yeah you never know what's going to happen but um yeah. what you did was that you got started on these things super early right you didn't wait you decided you wanted to go to med school and you knew you had to get those experiences and get that insight about you know about the field you wanted to get experience in hospital and clinic um, you wanted to get all your non-clinical experiences as well. And you didn't dilly-dally. You just you went straight ahead and did it. So more specifically, what kinds of extracurricular experiences did you gain? You said you had clinical, you had non-clinical. What kinds of things did you do? Yeah, so my freshman year, uh, first I did non-clinical volunteering. So that's what I started off with in a senior computer center. So I would help seniors with any technology-related concerns or any help they might need, like trying to get on, let's mm-hmm. say, like Amazon or try to purchase something or um, apply to jobs, get to make a resume, things like that. So, so, so things that we like, you know, people who are young find it like, really simple, but yeah. so I just uh, helped seniors with that. And then the second half of my first year, I volunteered in a PT clinic. So a physical therapy clinic where I'm just getting some clinical experience. Um, and I also like that summer is when I started volunteering in the Kaiser Permanente Emergency Department. So mm-hmm. that was all of my um, second year. And then COVID hit March 2020, couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. And then I think I took that summer and the next year to study for the MCAT. Well, I couldn't do anything else, you know. And then yeah. after like things started opening back up again. So the summer after my third year of college, um, that's when I shadowed and also did hospice volunteering for the rest of my college career. So that's how I got more clinical hours. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing about that. Um, now let's get into kind of the MCAT. Um, and as this is kind of like one of the underlying, um, themes of this interview, uh, did you have an ideal MCAT score before you started prepping for it? And before you took the exam, it is a big component of your application. Yeah. So my, my goal is anything over the median of uh, 510. So Anything mm-hmm. over that was honestly good with me because that's what, after that, it's just about like making a good personal statement and risk writing, good working activities and good secondaries. So okay. that was the goal. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So having that as your goal, when did you start prepping for the MCAT and uh, when did you end up taking the MCAT? Yeah, so I took the MCAT twice. So mm-hmm. I ended up starting uh, prep for it the summer after my second year. So about June of 2020. And then prep for three months and took it in September 27th, I think, 2020. I remember that was a very, that was a date because it's the very last um, day you could take the MCAT in 2020. And then after that, it was, um, and then I, I took a month off and then prep for six months and then took it in April of 2021. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you remember your score um, jump from the first time you took it to the second time? What were your, what would, what were the results of those, those two uh, tests? Yes, yeah, so the first one was a 497, so not too hot. Mm-hmm. But then uh, when I took, a, I took some time off and then prepped for a longer time, I was able to jump 13 mm-hmm. points to a 510. So. Okay, got you. Yeah. And, you know, I think taking your first time um, at the beginning of your third year gave you a lot of time to, in case, to prep again, prep. to take it again in time for your applications. Application, right? yeah. Okay, so so you hit your target, 510. You know, I introduced this interview saying that you didn't have like a score that was very, very competitive, but it's in the middle, right? So you're still going to have quite a number of options. So did you have your MCAT score before you started working on your applications? 
Yep, I had it about two to three weeks prior to how, like sending in my applications. So, so nice. yeah, I had it, and which impacted my school list a bit too. So. Okay, yeah. So that's great. You had your score. So you were working off of that. You knew that it wasn't a question mark <laughs> when you started applying. Um, now, what was your strategy? Because you mentioned selecting schools. What was your strategy for doing that, having that score, knowing what it was? Um, did you have Harvard and Stanford on your list? Or did no, you approach did, it differently? Yes, yeah, so I approached it differently. So basically, I used MSAR, which is what has like the stats for every med school. So I used that to kind of classify schools into reaches uh, about mid tier and also like lower tier. Like there were like targets for me. And also, I applied to about five or six DO schools. I think it was about six DO schools. So I approached it by so like the reaches would be like anything like 516, 515, then cat median. So it'd be like UCLA, UCI, and whatnot. And then the ones that are more targets were also closer to like the 511, 512, or mm -hmm. anything around that. So I applied to those MD schools, and then I applied to all the top tier DO schools. Okay, great. So you were really basing your list and, you know, um, and your, your estimation of your chances on their average accepted MCAT yeah. score. MCAT okay. scores. Okay, got you. Okay, so that was a really important thing for you to consider. How many schools did you apply to overall? It was about 40, 42, something like that, yeah. Okay, so that, that's a lot. That's a lot yeah. of schools. Um, in my experience, that's definitely on the higher end of how many schools people typically apply to. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit more later because it does impact what you do later mm -hmm. on in your application, right? The number of schools that you apply yeah. to. Um, so you did all of that on your own. You took the MCAT on your own. You, um, you chose your schools on your own. But at what point did you decide that you needed to get professional help for your application? Yeah, so I, I I read online about how important the personal statement and the work and activities and also like writing the secondaries were, so just making sure they're really polished. And so that's when I decided to get uh, like some professional help because proofreading it, just making sure they're like really well written. Because at a certain point, like stats, like, you know, they, they can get you so far, but making sure you can present yourself a certain way um, is what ultimately helps you land that acceptance, the interview and the acceptance, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you came to us and worked with us for your application process. Um, what was your first interaction with BMO like? I think it was with the initial consultant for the, um, I think there was like introductory meeting where just brainstorming ideas, for personal statements. So that was the first interaction that I had. And mm -hmm. then I realized, um, yeah, I wanted professional help. So then the next time we met, it was with already like um, a few rough drafts of my personal statement. So I um, okay. was able to get a few revisions in and also it was just back and forth with that. And then, yeah, so that's when I was yeah. able to submit my primary. Okay, great. So, yeah, the brainstorming sessions are typically the first um, sessions you'll do in uh, the med app programs that we have. And I want to just ask you what you did in that session and, and what you learned in that session. Yeah, so basically just brainstorming the ideas. Like, would, so essentially it was like an overlying theme is what you, um, usually like that goes on the brainstorming session and then mm -hmm. kind of relevant experiences that you can kind of underscore to help um, like boost that story essentially. Um, so yeah, and then also the work and activity section, brainstorming for that, all that volunteering experience and what's right. Yeah. So that was what we did in the brainstorming session. Yeah, yeah. So um, you had all the experiences, you you had all of that already. And the brainstorming session um, for someone like yourself uh, is usually a time when we reflect on all of those and make sure that you understand, you know, the most important things that you'll want to include and also how to structure it effectively. Okay, so that kind of helped you to get drafting. And then as you said, once you had the drafts, you went into revision mode right? With the expert back and forth, back and forth. What was the revision process like after you uploaded your first drafts? Yes, the revision process basically, um, once we have a rough draft, we would send it in using the website, the tool that BMO has. Um, and then the, the consultants usually take a look at that, like what I wrote, and then just 
as comments on the side like what to what to change and like you know what to keep and also if there was like let's say like a point that wanted that they wanted to bring up that kind of is more showing rather than telling you know so kind of like things like that like little things um so that's usually like what the process looked like Mm -hmm. okay got you so this process is a little bit different for every student for some Mm -hmm. students it's they get their revisions back and we're asking them to change big chunks and to rearrange things. It sounds like that didn't, that wasn't your case. You, you pretty much had a, a good, a well-structured draft and we were just helping to refine, fine tune the writing and also making sure you were um, really supporting your ideas with real examples, things like that to make them effective um, to the reader and make them reader oriented. Just in general, what did you learn from BMO experts about writing your applications that you think would be most important for other for other people to know, especially those who might also have less competitive stats or less competitive MCAT scores and for people who would find it really important to have an outstanding application? Yeah, I think it's just um, when we're writing our first statements and everything, we don't realize how much telling rather than showing word that we're doing because, <laughs> I mean, we've already done, done these, like, things, right? It's just, like, we, yeah. it feels, like, unnatural, I think, to, like, show, like, immediately. So I think, um, like, that's what, like, really helps going to a third party for it, just um, making sure we kind of flush out everything and we kind of supported everything with um, my showing, you know, so... Having mm-hmm. our claims and like you know what we did, and also just like providing examples and kind of linking it back to the main uh, main idea, essentially, of the statement. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is always even for me. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not applying to med school, but uh, there's like having a fresh eye look at my work is always really helpful, and certainly for something as important and as critical as your med school applications, that would be very helpful. Okay, so. In terms of timeline, when did you end up submitting your application to AMCAS and also AlchemAS, I guess? Yeah, so for AMCAS, I submitted it almost a week right after it opened. So Mm -hmm. it was actually less, it was about like five or six days. So So just so like that could maximize my chances during the rolling application process. Mm -hmm. And also um, the ACOMAS, that was uh, about a few days right after submitting my primary too, because they're very similar. Um, so I have to trim some stuff here and there. And then I think their character counts are about 100 short for each. So I was able to trim it and then also send it, send it to both. So. Mm-hmm. so you were very on top of it. I think this is one of our themes today. You were on top of getting your extracurricular activities done early. You were on top of getting your NCAT done early and having your score. And when it came to submitting your applications, you were also very on top of it. For those of you who are listening who um, aren't, sure what the rolling application process is. It basically means as soon as the systems open, schools start receiving applications and they already start reading applications. They don't wait until a certain time before they read all their applications. So that means that the sooner you get it, your applications in, um, the sooner they read it. And if you're if they're reading it early, that means at that point there's more open slots for them to push you to the next round and that's why your chances are higher when you submit earlier and this is actually going to be really important um, later on too as you move through the process right every delay can hurt you so um, you applied to 42 schools primary applications easy because you're submitting the same primary to all 42 schools that's fine but let's now talk about the secondaries because you, for the schools that want to see your secondaries, each school is going to send you a request and a different set of questions. Mm-hmm. So how many schools ended up asking you to submit secondary essays out of your 42? Yeah. Out of the 42, I think it was about 36. So pretty much most of the schools end up second, sending secondaries. So I was able to write, so write the secondaries full time because it was over the summer. Um, yeah. That also was an advantage for like submitting the primary early. So I got all my secondaries coming. I think it was like beginning in July is when they started rolling in. So okay. I was able to get, yeah, I was able to start writing my secondaries. Um, and also like, um, I think within a week of submitting them because I would have my draft and then I'll submit it to BMO and then get the revisions and then making sure they're 
they're all good to go. And then I would submit them right after. So Wow, fantastic. You got 36 requests to send in secondaries. Did you end up responding to every single one of them? Pretty much everything except for like maybe two or three. Uh, okay. Okay. Like, so that's first, quite... it was basically yeah. It was basically school, schools that I changed my mind. Like I was, <sighs> you know, what maybe I don't want to spend more money on them, and because uh, I, I wouldn't want to go anyways. So. Uh huh. Uh huh. But still, that's quite a lot. You got thirty six requests. You submitted secondary essays to almost all of them. And I think the key is something you already mentioned is that you were able to do this full time, right? Because you submitted your primaries in early, you were getting those requests during the summer and not during your fall term of your senior year. And so you were able to dedicate all of your time to writing those secondaries, revising those secondaries and submitting those secondaries. Um, Did you have to do any uh, going into your school term or no? Nope, I did not. I pretty much had everything done going into my school year. So, so you were done. Your interviews, yeah. Yeah, and then you went, and you yeah. were you had your mind cleared when yep. you started your senior mm-hmm. year. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I just okay. having to wait for inter- interviews, and that was it. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, um, now, how did you like? I know you were able to dedicate your time full time to secondaries, but there's still a lot to be organized there's still a lot of essays to write you were probably writing essays for multiple schools at the same time how did you organize all of that how did you approach this what were your strategies yes yeah, so basically my goal was to submit one secondary a day essentially like well like write one secondary day was more so was what the goal was and yeah so i i organized every school by the type of questions i would ask so i think the most common question was working with underserved communities or just so I'm mentioning something about um or the mission statement and like how you kind of fit in with the mission statement, what you could do to further the school's mission. Those two, those two are like pretty much nine out of ten schools asked those two questions. So I was able to have one good essay for all that and you kind of just well for the mission statement, I would write a different essay for every school. So that was the mm-hmm. only one I spent most of my time on. But for everything else, like underserved communities, and there's also a few other questions that are very common but I just can't think of it off the top yeah. of my mind. Uh, well so. I don't know if you got any of these I'm sure you did if you had 30 yeah. some schools but another one I can think of is usually like um how did you overcome a challenge or you know what's yeah. something that you experienced that was difficult that right you had to talk about kind of a negatively charged mm-hmm. personal experience yeah or, so yeah I remember that it's just been so long as like hard to remember the questions I would ask but yeah but yeah so the challenge that was also one of the most popular questions schools would ask and just making mm-hmm. sure I had had one of whoa like you know I had something written down for that too um yeah. so this way I was I was able to basically submit most of my secondaries like really like soon after they came in um yeah. there's just a mission statement one that I spent more time on so yeah yeah so so your strategy was generally to um group all the similar questions across the schools uh, and then just tweak as needed for the different essays and then to spend your time on the ones that were specific to each school. And like you said, even those, even though you had to write different essays, there are still questions that were repeated. Like, mm-hmm. how do you fit with our school and our mission? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, now, The revision process for secondaries and primaries is typically pretty similar, but is there anything you learned during that time about how you were writing and how to improve your writing um, for your secondaries? And yeah, it was pretty much the same thing for the secondaries too, just more showing rather than telling. Mm -hmm. Um, It's pretty much the same thing throughout the whole application process. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting because um, it shows that how hard that is to do, right? If... uh, you know, if you already knew that from your primaries, and I'm sure you were trying to do that for your secondaries too, and yet it's still something that, you know, um, one of the experts or the many experts that you worked with um, were reminding you for your secondaries. Mm -hmm. So it's nice that you were able to get their help to be able to implement that feedback for all of your secondaries as well. Fantastic. Okay. Now you mentioned interviews a couple of times. That's all you're waiting for in that mm-hmm. fall fall term. Uh, what were some of your concerns about the interview process? Um, 
before you even got invites, before any of it happened? Yeah, so essentially my plan was to um, do the mock interviews after I received them. So they're kind of fresh and I have like, um, I would do them a week or two out from the actual date. So I have time to synthesize those tips and feedback I've received. So, so yeah, I'm also generally a relatively strong interviewer because um, I think it just comes down to, I think if you're like extroverts to kind of have an advantage in this, in this stage where like, you know, we're able to talk about ourselves pretty easily. So, um, so yeah, um, just so again, ending up just taking it, taking help for the panel interview and just like how to present ourselves kind of like a, a general, um, general set of rules. And then for MMI, I wasn't sure going in what the process was like. So definitely had a session for the MMI as well. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's how the mock interview process looked like. So that was what I was working on prior to receiving the interview invites. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, before you even started doing anything with BMO, did you have a good idea of what kinds of questions you were going to be asked? What did you know about interviews before going in, before doing any kind of prep? Before doing any prep, I definitely knew they would ask the most personal statement questions. Or like, okay, why, why, you know, medicine, then why DO or do DO schools? Mm-hmm. And also overcoming a challenge. Like those are very popular interview questions. So I already knew they would ask that, but then I did not know about the quirky questions they would ask. So <laughs> uh, just uh, like, let's say they would provide like a, a phrase or like a saying and then just ask what you think of that that was I think that was Western's interview um also I did not know anything about the end of mine so my first introduction to that was during the mock interview so mm-hmm. okay okay yeah and for those of you who are listening who are not sure what MMI is it stands for multiple mini interview and it's basically a format where you have multiple stations that you go to and each station has its own prompt you have time to read and think about the prompt and then you go into the station in front of an interviewer and you give your response and there may or may not be some back and forth uh, between you and the interviewer after you give your response follow-up questions and answers things like that Um, and it like you said a lot of people don't know about the MMI or don't know what it's like Um, so it is very helpful to get some realistic experience so um, just to dial back a bit, how many in- invites did you end up getting in that cycle, Conan? Yeah, so I got about five interview invites. So, um, uh-huh. and then the outcomes were pretty much three acceptances and then two wait lists after the interviews. And I got into one of the two wait lists after, after the fact. So, okay. And, so not uh, bad. Yeah. Pretty good yield, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, now let's get into the interview. Um, a little bit. I want to see if we can dig into what you learned so that we can give that same advice to those listening to this interview. What did you find most helpful about your mock interviews? Yeah, the mock interviews are set up very much like the real thing. And the questions that are asked in the mock interview are pretty much like nine out of 10 questions are going to be the same um, as real. So it would help me like going in that I kind of knew what to expect. But the quirky questions, of course, you never know what could, what could come. So yeah. um, that was basically like, you know, what I had going in. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned quirky questions. You must have gotten one that yeah. was tough. Do you remember what it was? It was, um, I think it was one of the things AT still mentioned. So he's a very well, popular, I think he was a founder of the deal philosophy. So I think it was something out of the book that he wrote. Um, it was a certain quote about holistic medicine. I think that was what it was. And just yeah. like the like what I thought about it. So essentially, um, um, I would mention what I th- what what I meant what I thought about it and also kind of related it to my experience. So I, I thought it was crucial to relate it back to like my personal state and my passion of pursuing medicine. I think that's why they really liked it, rather than just mentioning what I thought about the statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a great implementation of some of the strategies that we teach is that um, for quirky questions, it's not just answering the question, you also want to relate it to yourself, because the whole point of an interview is for them to get to know you, right? So so I think you did that um, beautifully. Uh, What do you think were the areas that you improved on the most? Because you said you already went into it feeling pretty good you feel like you interviewed well but um but I'm curious what areas you felt you saw improvement 
Uh, so I knew that I use a lot of filler words. Um, that, that's why I received feedback on too. So trying to just um, work on like, reducing my filler words. So just like mm -hmm. just slowing down. Um, and also um, I was a little bit of non-professional um, words as well with you guys, y'all, things like yeah. that. It's just really natural. Like it just comes out naturally, just just like the, the nature like environments that we're in. So um, just those little things were, well, I was able to fine tune that going into my interviews. So those actually mm -hmm. make a pretty big impact to filler words and also just professional demeanor, I think. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, because they're natural things we do in our day-to-day -day speech, it's very, very hard to even notice that you're doing them. So having someone else who's experienced and who has seen a lot of different people interview uh, give you that feedback is really, really helpful for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So just once again, I know you mentioned this before, how many acceptances did you receive in the end and which school did you end up choosing and why? Yes, yeah, so I received about four acceptances. So one of them, like it was three right after the interview and also one of them was after the wait list after the interview. And mm -hmm. I ended up choosing Western just because of the, like, it's also in state and also relatively close to home. It's not like super close. It's like still a five hour drive or a one hour flight away. Um, so yeah, I ended up choosing the Western, Western U because it's a very, very good school, very established, so. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned it being close to home being one of the factors. So does that mean the other schools that you got into were out of state or farther away? Yes. So yeah, the other schools I got into, um, one of them was in Utah. So there's, it's pretty far away. And also it, it wasn't close to any airports nearby. So um, I think that was also a pretty big thing. So if it was out of state, it's just being really close, like a 10 minute Uber away. Um, so, so yeah, mm -hmm. so the other schools are all out of state. So Okay. Well, on the surface, it sounds like you're just choosing based on distance, but being close to a, your support network is very important during it's med very school. Important. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I didn't realize how much I rely on it even during med school, but like how hectic the, the whole schedule is, just having that support system. And also just like college friends, like relatively nearby too. They're all like a few hour drive away. Mm -hmm. um, and also like some also live near my, near the area too, because well, I went to school in Santa Cruz. So a lot of people are California natives. So yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So you're at a school. Are you enjoying it? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So okay. Yeah. So currently, um, well, every um, at school, learning a lot of like uh, learning a lot of things. You know, it's, I feel like it's it's a it's a whole like it's like almost drinking water out of, out of fire hose amount of information. Yeah. Um. So yeah, yeah. Currently, I mean, it's like I realize how much I've learned from starting med school. That like, I mean, it's kind of hard to realize that, but. Yeah. That's what I realized. So, yeah. yeah. And are you glad that you're there? Yep, definitely. And also, OMM is a very useful trick to use on like you know family and friends. I feel like uh -huh. that's something I could like continually show on people. It's like, it's like a cool party trick essentially. So good while well, visiting family for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay. <laughs> Practice gotcha. OMM on our friends and family. So. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Now, one last question: Is there anything you want to say to future applicants, people who might be watching this? Um, and who might be on the fence about working with BMO, um, what's your advice to them? Yeah, so I would definitely say like stats can also, that they're very important, yeah, but also presenting yourself um, in a way that med schools really like like to see people. I feel like just kind of writing your, like, and also pre like presenting your experiences in a way um, that's also very important. It's almost like equally as important as your stats. So I just realized, I just think it's kind of easily glanced over it's like the last step, you know, so I think that's that's one of the tips I, I would mention for future applicants. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So very important presenting yourself in writing, also important presenting yourself in person when you get to interviews. Yeah. And those are the things that you really felt that you benefited from, which is awesome. And we're very glad to have been part of that process and see you through to that moment where you got your acceptances. Fantastic. And congratulations once again. And Thank you so much for your time, Kanan. I hope everyone here has really found this interview to be helpful, hearing it from a live applicant himself who uh, has succeeded and who has taken all the right steps to ensure that he got there. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Anytime. Yeah.